had the opportunity to say to you already this morning, I want to thank you very much for being a part of the Griffin Expo. You can imagine how much work goes into putting on something like this, but we can tell you that it's worth every ounce of effort. Uh, this is really important to us uh, on a number of levels, but one of them, uh, this is kind of our home turf. And uh, certainly for GGS Pro, we love being here and presenting because so many of us have been working together. Some of you have been working with me for more than 20 years. I know I look too young for that. Somebody say yes. <laughs> uh, but it's really a great part of the business, and some of us are email friends, and I've got to meet you for the first time. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please stop by our booth a little bit later on today. Uh, we'll start a little bit late, but we're going to cover all the information, so we'll, we'll get through all this in due time. First, I want to say just a minute about GGS Pro. For those of you that aren't as familiar with it, I'm really privileged to work with three of the most highly motivated professionals out there. They love what they do. They come to work each day with the opportunity to help growers. And it's a, great, it's a great way to make a living. And we enjoy what we do, and it's a great team, and we cross-train so that when you call in, no matter who you get, you're going to get very similar information from all of us, and that we do that on purpose it means a lot to us. And as you can see from our mission statement, it's really important to us that we are relaying this information in a form that's useful to you. I always kid around with the rest of GGS Pro. If they're going to give a presentation, I say the goal is not for the people to walk away and say, gee, they really are smart. The idea is to make sure everybody goes home with take home messages, things that you can incorporate in your business to be more profitable and, and, and uh, more successful um, when you leave here. So if I see you later on today, I might ask you what you learned this morning, something you can take home to your business, and I hope you have something for me. Uh, we take over 15,000 technical calls and emails a year, and that sounds like a lot of work, and it is, but the great thing is we have so much contact with growers, we're making so many recommendations that we get a lot of feedback. And in a real sense, the growers help us to stay current, stay ahead of the curve, because we spot trends with pesticides that are failing, problems that are creeping up long before it gets out in the public media, um, because we have such great rapport with all of our growers, so thank you for helping us to stay on top of it. Some of you have benefited from our technical bulletins, probably most of you at one time or another. We have over 200 in print, and we try to write them all the same way in language. It will be useful and helpful to growers and not a lot of technical jargon. If you see technical jargon, you tell me. We'll, we'll fix it. And we have a digital library of over 2,000 digital images, some of which that were sent to us by growers. Others are ones that we took ourselves, but they help us in diagnosing. Um, uh, plant diseases and insect problems and other physiological disorders. So it's a very important part of the work we do, and you'll see them in our presentations as well. All these services, by the way, are free of charge to Griffin customers. If you're a good customer of Griffin, you're getting all this for free, and we're happy to provide that. What I wanted to start out with today is I want to spend a little bit of time. You know, last year we introduced some new pesticides, and they had just come out and become registered right around the time of the expo. So we were able to tell you a lot about what we had learned of them. But now we've had a year for them to be out and the growers to be using them. We've learned a lot, and we'll tell you where they've uh, met or exceeded expectations or where they didn't quite get over the bar. And as always, you know, we call them the way we see them. Um, we, we just want to make sure we're making the best recommendations we can to you and passing along the best information. Sultan is a miticide, and I would say that if you all were long, growing long enough ago, did you remember the introduction of Abbott and how that kind of turned mite control on its head when it was introduced many years ago? This is the first miticide since then that has that kind of effect. It's a brand new mode of action. It is certainly head and shoulders right now above everything else that's out there as far as miticides go. So we like Sultan quite a bit. There's some things to know about, and we'll, we'll kind of catch that as we go through. You can see that it's labeled for a wide variety of sites, and not only greenhouses, but interior scapes and, and outdoor uses as well. Pretty much, for most of our growers, you should consider it a one-trick pony. It controls two-spotted spider mites and does it extremely well, but it doesn't get broad mite and cyclamen mite and some other mite pests. So um, for two-spotted spider mites, nothing better, but it's pretty much a rifle shot rather than a, a shotgun when it comes to mites. It does not have translaminar activity, however, it does have contact activity for at least three weeks, I'm going to say, based on, on our growers' um, expectations, what they've been seeing out in the field. And it controls all the life stages, including the egg, which is pretty rare. So that's another valuable part of Sultan. Because it is so contact dependent, we need to get good spray coverage, but we found it works extremely well through foggers. In fact, when the product was first released, we asked BASF to do some trials. They bought a cold fogger and trialed it. And they found extremely good results to a cold fog, or you'd expect the same to an autofog or a pulse fog. In a lot of cases, they had dead mites within 12 hours after the application was made. Um, excellent plant safety, including open blooms, just a lot to like about Sultan. 
Bear in mind you know, that spider mites have a very well-deserved reputation for overcoming miticides uh, due to resistance. And so you'll see that on the salt label, you're only allowed to use it twice per crop. And it's not over plant safety concerns, it's over uh, resistance concerns. I'd like to be able to stand up here five years from now and tell you the Sultan is working just as well as it is now. And it's going to take the whole grower community following those rules and going through the rotations to make that happen. So we'll be glad to help you with your rotations. Expire is another new product that came out last year. And a couple of interesting things here. One, it's a, it's a dual active ingredient product. Now, one of them, um, sulfoxiflor, and if you've been, a lot of you have done a really good job of learning your mode of action codes. Uh, sulfoxiflor is a 4C. Now, to put that in context for your neonicotinoids, things like Safari and Flagship Marathon are 4A. The nicotines, which we don't really use anymore, are 4Bs. And this is a 4C. So it is different from a neonicotinoid, but maybe if you want to think of it this way, it's sort of like on, the, on a different branch of the same family tree. Um, the manufacturer claims there's no cross resistance. Um, we, we might beg to differ on some cases about that, and we'll talk about that as we go through. But it's a very good product. The other active ingredient is spinodorin, and that is in the same mode of action as conserve. In fact, we like to say it's conserve's big brother. Um, the practical implications of that are that although it's done a good job controlling thrips in a lot of cases, thrips that are resistant to conserve will, will not take very long to overcome this as well. Uh, due to resistance, so we are uh, recommending it more sparingly, particularly if thrips is the primary target. We won't use it very often in rotation because we don't want to reactivate all the resistance that's already there due to conserve. So when you take a look at some of the insects that it controls, you can see it's a, a pretty wide variety. I would say for expire, where we've had outstanding results is on aphids. Um, we get up to four weeks of control on aphids from one spray application. That's about as good as you can get from a spray application, so that is very noteworthy. It is also very active against caterpillars and, uh, and beetles of all kinds, really. It does a great job there. Um, on thrips, we talked about good results, but we got it on a short leash due to its similarity to conserve. White flies is where we feel like there was some disappointment there. Um, we were expecting it to be equally effective against the B and the Q biotype white fly. The Q is the very pesticide resistant one. Um, on the B biotype white fly, we've had excellent results, kills them very quickly. On the Q biotype, it's been disappointing uh, to the point where we won't recommend it. If we know we have a Q biotype infestation in a greenhouse, we're not gonna recommend expire to you. So that's what we live and learn. We go through, we get the trials, had some growers work with it. And so we, again, we call in the way that we see them. It does have very quick knockdown ability, but it's also a translaminar systemic. And if you're not familiar with that term, when we say something is a translaminar systemic, we mean that it will move through layers of tissue from a foliar spray. So sprayed on the top surface of the leaf, it'll migrate to the lower surface of the leaf. It won't move from the left-hand side of the plant to the right-hand side, and it won't move up in the plant, but it will help your coverage by getting to the bottom side of that leaf if you can't get there. So it is a very useful, um, useful trait. Excellent plant safety, by the way. Um, it's been tested at uh, higher than the label rate. We've seen no damage even on open blooms. So any ornamental crop you can feel very comfortable uh, applying expire to. It's also labeled for greenhouses and ornamental nurseries. There are some restrictions on how many times a year you can use it. And again, this is due to resistance management. Last year, we spent a lot of time talking about bee safety and helping growers make sure that we're ensuring the safety of our pollinators. Um, with Expire, we know this, that it, it's very toxic to bees, but only for three hours. So we use it a lot like we do TriStar. We know that bees stop foraging mid to late afternoon. So if we can go out and make a spray late in the day, by the next morning, the Expire is no longer toxic to the bees. So it allows us to use it um, where we might not be able to otherwise, by understanding the bees and also understanding how Expire works. Mainspring, very interesting product. This is another brand new mode of action for us. We desperately need those from a resistance management standpoint. And um, we, we've learned a lot about uh, Mainspring in the last year. When we looked at the data originally when this product was presented to us, the first thing I said was this looks like a great drench product. And that has proven to be true. Over the course of the year, we've seen a migration to growers using it more and more as a drench um, than a spray, although there are some very good spray applications for it as well. Now, if you take a look at the list of pest control, I would say on there that um, interesting thing, aphids um, from a foliar spray does not control them, but from a drench, it works phenomenally well. 
we had some Easter lily growers that um, applied it, got six weeks of control from one drench application, which is really noteworthy. Uh, very effective on beetles, caterpillars, extremely good. Um, leaf miners only as a drench, um, but very effective against leaf miners. Thrips works, it works well against thrips as a spray and a drench. So we're all looking for things to add to our thrips rotation, and mainspring really needs to be part of that. And it's very helpful because it uh, has excellent bloom safety. We're not aware of any phytotoxicity issues with it. It has just a four-hour re-entry interval, so we can really work this into most programs, and we like to do it. Currently, it's only labeled for greenhouse use, but Syngenta feels very confident that after the first of the year, a new label revision will allow it to be used on outdoor crops as well. From a foliar spray, it does have that good translaminar activity as a drench. It's a little slow to move up. It may take a week to get fully up through the plant, but it, it does move up quite nicely as well. And as I mentioned, we're seeing really long residuals from a drench application. It's interesting to note that when the product first came out, uh, the drench, um, drench rate on the label just said 12 ounces per 100 gallons. In the last year, they put out a supplemental bulletin that says you can use it at 8 ounces per 100 gallons. And the research that we saw indicates even at four ounces per 100 gallons, it does a good job against a lot of pests. So depending on the pest and the length of residual activity that you need, we may recommend four, we may recommend eight. Uh, we have yet to recommend 12 ounces per 100, 100 gallons. One is pretty expensive at that rate. I'll show you a chart in a minute. But also really doesn't seem to be necessary um, to, to put that higher rate on there. Spray rates are all over the lot. The label says one to 16 ounces per 100 gallons, like go fish. Um, we, we found that for most uses, four ounces per 100 gallon works quite well. We'll use eight ounces per 100 gallons for thrips if we're really trying to lengthen our longevity and how long the control will last. So good product, we like it a lot. Here's a, uh, a chart, you know, and sometimes we kind of hesitate to share um, cost and use information because the price of the product, and, you know, is one factor, of course, we have to consider, but sometimes we don't, we can't always go by that. We have to take a look at efficacy and length of control to decide how good a deal it is. But I think it brings out a couple of interesting points. One is by reducing that rate down on the mainspring drench, it makes it competitive with the other really good drench products that are out there. And the other thing I think is interesting, um, and we'll mention this a little bit later on in the presentation, there's a lot of confusion about drench volumes. Um, there is not one standard drench volume that you can use that covers all products. In other words, how many ounces of drench solution do I put on a 10-inch hanging basket? And this chart really shows the fact that if you look at Mainspring's cost for the 10-inch hanging basket, it, it goes up considerably compared to the other products because that label calls for a higher drench volume in a 10-inch hanging basket than the other products. So at a 6-inch pot, they're almost the same but you get up to a 10-inch hanging basket, it becomes more expensive. And that is due to the label-mandated drench volumes. So it's amount of active ingredient plus the drench volume that gets us to our final cost. And we'll be happy to talk that through with you. Now, Rycar is something that really surprised us. Um, we had very little data on Rycar when it was first released last year because it's a company, from, uh, it's a product from a Japanese company that an American company got the rights to. So it didn't go through our normal channels where we saw a lot of research being done on it the years leading up to its release. So we were kind of hesitant to recommend it very much. I'm happy to report that for aphids and white flies, Rycar is just doing a phenomenal job. Last year, we cautioned you that there was no approval to use Rycar on poinsettia bracts. We did not use it, but research was done on over 100 varieties of poinsettias on the bracts, and it didn't damage any of them. So we very, feel very confident about not only the plant safety, but the ability of Rycar to control aphids and also the B and the Q biotype whitefly. Right now, this is one of our best aces in the hole for the Q biotype whitefly. It's getting very difficult to control them due to the lack of options that are out there, but Rycar is doing a phenomenal job. Um, it does stop feeding very quickly, which is kind of nice when you have things like aphids that can be transmitting viruses. The feeding stops right away. Sort of like Endeavor, we'll tell you that it might take three to five days for the insect to actually dry up and die, even though the feeding stopped right away. And something similar to that would be true of Rycar as well. As far as other labeled pests, it does work very well on chili thrips, but not the western flower thrip. Uh, leaf hoppers, mealybugs are on the label, but it just has not performed well enough, so we do not recommend it as a mealybug product. Some efficacy data, I know charts early in the morning, even with two cups of coffee can get boring, but we'll go through this pretty quick. And the right car is the blue line, and at the label rate, you can see that going out 21 days, three weeks after application, still nearly 100% control of the Q biotype white fly. There's really not too many other products out there that are going to come close to matching that right now. So we feel like that's a really good looking data. Now, in fairness, the orange line is Safari, 
and they use it at a rate halfway between the low and the high rate. We always use the high rate, so it might have done, Safari may have done a little better had they used the higher rate for that. Um, Rycar can be fogged as well, which uh, again, since it does have contact activity, and you probably know from talking to us, we are, are very big fans of the, um, uh, the fogger equipment, the autofog, um, and the cold fog made by DRAM, we're big fans of that, and for really large operations, we also uh, recommend the pulse fog, which is the thermal fogger, and talk to us about it if you will. One, there's specials on them today at the show, but if you're interested in talking about fogging, we'll let you know how we support you in that. So it does a great job either way. Um, very good, a lot of you are using biological controls and we're working with many of you on this. RICAR is safe over almost all the bio controls and also very safe on bees. So a lot to like about RICAR in that regard. You will notice like a lot of the new products, we're only allowed to make two applications per crop cycle and that's due to resistance management. Emblem, um, I wonder how many of you use Medallion in your operations? Thought so, it's a great product and we highly recommend it. Um, Emblem has the same active ingredient as Medallion, but it is in a, what we call an SC or a, a water-based um, solution, so it's a liquid rather than the powder. And that, that's, there's some convenience factor there, but the real reason I think you might want to consider Emblem it, is labeled for a lot of vegetable transplants and some herbs. And we could really use a product like this, um, Medallion and, and Emblem really good against botrytis. And that's a big problem, it's going to winter time on the herbs, a lot of you get the stem canker, get losses from that. And also as a soil drench, it's very effective against Rhizoctonia, Philabiopsis, Fusarium. So um, here's a way to, for your vegetable transplants and, and certain of your herbs, we can use this product um, and you get all the benefits you're used to from Medallion. Hachi Hachi, um, wasn't that long ago, that was kind of a cuss word around Griffin. Um, when it was, the first product that was released, it was an EC formulation and it burned a lot of crops and we very quickly stopped selling it once our growers started to report the problems they had with it. It's been several years, but they have improved the formulation. It's now an, also an SC, so it's a water base, that thick petroleum base to it and is much, much safer on plant material. A couple of our growers were kind enough to be involved in the trials before it was released and they, other than um, nicking up some impatience, they really, and we don't, definitely don't want you to use it on patients, it really did a very good job, not only controlling insects, but also not damaging the crops. So uh, we have decided to start selling um, Hachi Hachi SC. Um, we think that the best uses for it are gonna be for um, aphids. Um, it also does a, uh, it suppresses white flies. I don't think it's as strong, so it does a great job on caterpillars, but thrips is really the big reason. It's mode of action 21A. There's no other thrip products that we use there in that mode of action. So let us lengthen out our, our uh, rotation a little bit. We'll probably be recommending it primarily earlier in the spring before we're close to bloom time so we get a better feel for just how safe it is on open blooms. You can see there's still some cautions. Interesting that, um, we'll talk about it in a minute, but actually also suppresses powdery mildew quite well. And other products in mode of action 21A, even though they're insecticides and miticides, also suppress powdery mildew, so it's not quite as crazy as it sounds. Um, here again, we've got another product that is gonna limit the number of uses to twice per crop, so we'll have to use it sparingly, and I think we want to. Um, it does work by contact um, with the insect, but it also leaves a residual in the leaves, and if they eat that, if they consume it from the leaf surface, that will kill them as well. 12-hour REI. I think most of us can work it into our programs. And here's the picture I do want to point out. I don't know why they do this. This is uh, suppressing powdery mildew on cucumbers. It's not labeled for edible crops, just ornamentals. In fact, ornamentals in the greenhouse. But I think maybe they use cucumbers because it's so susceptible to powdery mildew and they got what they were looking for in that regard. But at the 13 ounce per 100 gallon rate, it actually does a great job on powdery mildew as well. A nice, a nice uh, side benefit, the fact you know that just like we're having trouble with insect resistance, we also have trouble with powdery mildew, botrytis resistance, and so it's nice to have a different mode of action to use on powdery mildew occasionally as well. A couple of newer products here, some of them, one just got released, a couple are on their way here in the next couple of months, so I wanted to talk to you about them. Um, Mural, a lot of you are probably very familiar with Heritage. Heritage is what we call a strobiluron fungicide. Strobilurons are, actually they're um, synthesized from, um, they're, they're wood decaying fungus that have fungicidal properties and, and they're all kind of in that class. And the unique things about strobilurons are they tend to have a long residual so you can get multiple weeks of control from one spray. Uh, the other thing that's really notable about them, however, is that they tend to be only preventative, they're not curative and it's certainly Heritage is in that category. Heritage does have one unique factor, and we talked about translaminar systemics and the ability to move from the top of the leaf to the bottom of the leaf. Heritage is unique 
it has what's called acropetal movement also. That means it moves up into new tissue. And if you think about this, if you have a product that might have a two week residual, but if it doesn't move up into the new foliage, does new leaves come out of the growing tip, they're now become vulnerable to powdery mildew or whatever we're treating for. And we have to retreat just to get that new foliage, even though the control's still good lower down the plant. Heritage moves up for a period of time into the new foliage, so its longevity is better than some of the, the competing products that are out there. So what Syngenta has done to overcome the fact that Heritage doesn't have, like the other strobe lens, does not have contact activity, they've added a new fungicide called Salatinol. Salatinol also overcomes another flaw of the strobe lens, and that's that they don't control botrytis very well. So Salatinol not only gives contact control for the disease that's already present, but it also adds botrytis control to that heritage package, which was missing in the past. So this is gonna be out later on this year. If you're in New York State, probably sometime in the next century. Uh, but the, sorry guys. Um, but it's, uh, we expect it out probably, certainly for next spring, it should be out. Another nice thing about it, you know, heritage is not labeled for vegetable crops, but uh, mural will be uh, for vegetable transplants in the greenhouse. So that's another nice tool as well to be able to use a really great fungicide combination on your vegetable transplants in there. It'll also be labeled as a drench or spray, so it's gonna pick up a lot of different diseases. You can see, um, like most of your strobe allure on this, it's very broad spectrum. It works on uh, powder, well with, with salatinol, it controls botrytis, but also powdery and downy mildews, a lot of leaf spots and so forth. And as a drench, uh, it works on some important stem and crown area diseases as well. So be listening for Mural. I think that's gonna be a, a, a big, big winner for next year. This product actually, when I first made the slide, I think your handouts may say coming soon. Um, OHP was kind enough to actually bump up the introduction date to make sure we had it for the expos. And so we want to talk about triathlon BA a little bit. I imagine a lot of you are familiar with um, fungicides that use Bacillus subtilis. It's a bacteria that does a great job of controlling foliar diseases in particular. It also works on some root rot diseases too. Um, we use cease quite a bit. You'll see cease in our bulletins all the time and we continue to recommend it as a top right or you know, top right product. That's a different bacillus than the one that's in triathlon. So we get the advantage. We, we'll, we'll still be recommending cease um, often, but we have a different a little bit different uh, product here, different bacteria to use to put in rotation, and especially for our, our OMRI friends out there that are growing organically. So it's listed as, an, uh, as a fungicide and a bacteria side. It's very difficult to find any types of products that control bacteria, so it's always great to have another one to add to that side of it. We see more and more xanthomonas and pseudomonas leaf spots all the time, and not just on perennials, but we see them in annual crops and vegetable crops in the greenhouse as well. So we're looking for all the help we can get there on, on that front. You'll see this label, very broad label. It's labeled for edible crops and herbs and so forth. It's labeled for ornamentals, labeled in the greenhouse, outside the greenhouse. It's been available in agriculture under another name for several years, and, and that really helped us. Um, because in agriculture, you know, they're just, if their crop yields aren't good um, using this product, they're going to stop using it. And it's continued to grow in popularity in ag, and now it's labeled for us as well. So we feel good about it. Um, on the label, you will notice that there are soil drench applications. To date, we have not seen any really data on that, so we're not, we're not mentioning that now other than to say it's on the label. Hopefully by this time next year, we'll have good data for it and let you know, what, you know how we feel about it as a soil drench product. As a foliar spray, we feel very confident about it. You can see it's a very broad list of labels, all like C's. Um, very, very broad um, applications there and companion, I should mention as well. So it's a very broad spectrum, and like the others, the way it works, when you spray it on, it colonizes the leaf and stem surfaces, and it creates what we call a zone of inhibition. There's an area around it where uh, fungal and bacterial spores won't germinate. So you can see that it's gonna be a preventative. It's already there, we need to use something else, or at least something else in combination with it. But very effective in that regard. I would say on average, you should expect seven to 10 days of control, preventative control from that. The label is very flexible, and if you are, let's say, working on downy mildew and basil, you can spray as often as every three days if you need to. That's legal by uh, by the label. If that's uh, if you need to do that, it also fogs well. Um, we like regalia a lot, but we found that it gets kind of gummy and foggers, and it can go through, but it'll tend to coat all your equipment with this magenta-colored gel. Um, we don't have any of those issues with triathlon or with seats, for that matter. Um, so both of these products can be fogged really well. There's a wide range of rates on the label. We're gonna suggest you to use two, two quarts per 100 gallons, which is um, four teaspoons per gallon if you're doing a small batch. You can see it's OMRI listed if you're growing organically. 
just a four hour re-entry interval and it has a zero day PHI, which means a pre-harvest interval. That means that you can um, treat it and then sell that product the same day that you treated it if you're growing edible crops to harvest in the greenhouse. A couple more products a little bit further down the line, but if you're like me, I like to know what's coming and it's good to have some encouragement out there. We're certainly looking for new modes of action. There is a, a, a product that's very interesting to us. It's gonna be coming out through OHP. It's still in testing, so you see we're, it originally said January of 2017. I think that that may get moved up into sometime late next year, but obviously they're doing their due diligence to do all the testing. But this is a pretty phenomenal product. It can be used as a spray or a drench, and you can see major pests, including aphids and white flies, and heaven knows we need new white fly products. And it really are, even on aphids, and until these latest introductions, we're getting pretty thin on effective products there as well. So we're real looking forward to this product coming out. It mentions that acropetal movement, in other words, moving up into new tissue after it's been applied, which really helps the longevity of control as well. Of course, a lot of our insect pests are going for the youngest tissue anyway, so it's great that it's moving up into there. So expect good things out of this product. Syngenta has a product that will be out sooner, and it's got two active ingredients in it, and again, it'll be used as a spray or a drench, and it's gonna uh, give very good plant safety. Uh, we expect uh, uh, a short REI in all likelihood, and it's going to be a great product for aphids, thrips, white flies, and some others as well. So a little further down the road, I want to let you know there is some, some help on the horizon in terms of new products. I mentioned um, in the beginning of the presentation when we were talking about salt and uh, the new miticide, how difficult it is to control mites with miticides right now. Once you get away from salt, and there's still some good miticides out there, but resistance has taken a chunk out of almost all of them, and some of them are really just totally ineffective anymore. So we really welcome the addition of salt, but to be honest with you, it, what has really done it has sharpened our game on biocontrols, and a lot of you, we, a lot of you are using biocontrol now in spider mites, or you at least talk to us about it. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about it for a couple of reasons. One is I think, you know, it'll only be a matter of time before we're, we're back in the same boat without effective miticides again. And for a lot of us, I think what we really need to do, we need to have a success. We need to have a win with biocontrol. And spider mites actually is one of the easier um, pests to control with beneficial insects and mites. So I think it'd be a good place to, to talk about it. And then by all means, stop by the booth or give us a call and we'll get in more detail with you. So as, as we mentioned a couple times today, the resistance is really a big deal. If you ever wonder what kind of keeps GGS Pro up at night, <laughs> it's pesticide resistance because, you know, we, we feel obligated to keep, give you good rotations that work well. And it's getting harder and harder to do that. We're not in despair, but we got to be really careful. And using biocontrol, even if it's only a part of your program, uh, can be very helpful in reducing pesticide resistance. Um, I have one grower that's doing a very good job with their biocontrol in their greenhouse, but come May 1, Temperatures get warm, the pests start reproducing faster, and he starts bringing in material from other houses, he, he reverts to spraying. And I said, you're doing a great job. Uh, rather than starting spraying in January and February, you're not spraying until May 1st. So you use a lot less pesticide, there's a lot less resistance pressure coming up, and you can spray when you need to at the, at the end and, and still do a really good job. So um, we don't have to go 100% biologicals to consider it a success. So um, there are compatible pesticides available. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. The fact that um, GGS Pro has compiled a database that allows us to know if you are using biocontrols in your greenhouse and the need to spray comes up because one pest is getting ahead of the predators. In many cases, there is a pesticide that is safe over the other biologicals you're using so it can go after that insect or mite that's getting out of hand without blowing up the whole biocontrol program. And that's something I don't think you'll find anybody else that has this level of information that GGS Pro is accumulating. It's part of our way of, of helping you to be successful with biocontrols. So one of the things we did, you know, there are so many nuances and you know, you all have been growing crops in a lot of cases for many years and you, you have your chemical control, you know, pretty well down pat. You have to insert new products as other ones uh, fade out, but you, you know how to run a spray program. For a lot of you, a biocontrol program is new and it does seem daunting at first. So what we tried to do is accumulate all the information that a grower would need into one place. And we have what we call our quick sheets and they are in the, the reference guide, by the way, and the updated ones will be in the, in the new reference guide coming out in January, the fourth edition. Um, but we accumulate all the information that's really vital for growers to know to be successful. It takes a lot more than rates. Um, we will let you know if there's requirements of what time of day they're to be released, where on the plants some need to be released in the lower leaves in the plant, other common vials that should be released in a shady spot in the greenhouse. All that information is really vital for you to have success. We also include information is when you get a shipment in, these are living things, in some cases they're getting shipped from overseas, 
you need to know when you open that container, are they living, are they viable or not? So with each of the pests, uh, each of the predators, we tell you how to evaluate them for, um, for viability when they come in. So all these types of tricks of the trade that you need to know are all accumulated in there. Of course, the rates are on there as well. And then you have GGS Pro to back you up. What we find is usually the first year in a biocontrol program, we're spending a lot of time coaching the grower and getting them up to speed. We tell them it's like growing another crop. But by year two and year three, we hear from them much less often. They, they start to figure it out and they know what they want to do and they're just calling us occasionally for advice. So we're all in. We're, we're here to help you with that if you're interested in it. So talking about spider mite control, I kind of want to tell you about some of the good guys. We talk about the bad guys all the time. Um, Phytocellus persimilis, I, I kind of liken them to the Marine Corps of BCAs. I mean, they show up and they start running all over the plant. They eat every mite in sight, the eggs and everything else, and they, they are, are fast and on the move. One of our grower friends, the first time he received a shipment of persimilis in, he was talking to me on the phone. I guess he was kind of fidgeting with the cap, and all of a sudden he says, I got to go. I said, what's the matter? And he says, they're coming up my arm. I loosened the cap too much. I had to run out and shake them off in the crop. But the Persimla shows up ready to work. And one of the things that's unique, we represent Syngenta Bioline and some other companies as well. Syngenta Bioline is the only company um, in the United States where you can buy Persimlas that are reared here in the U.S. They rear them by the billions in the strawberry fields out in California, and we can ship them overnight to you. And it's a really big advantage. One, it keeps the cost down, but you get mites that have just come out of the, the insector area, and they are ready to go to work when you get them. Uh, they, they work best on smooth leaf things, and a lot of you get tropicals up from Florida. And when I talk about mite resistance, you're probably groaning a little bit, Diplandinia, Mandevilla, hibiscus, things like that, they almost always come up with highly resistant spider mites on them. In Florida, they're spraying them year-round, and they're resistant to everything. So that's where we've used these spider mites, where the miticides aren't working any longer, to introduce growers to it. And those smooth, smooth leaf tropicals, they just do a great job. When you get into some of the real oily stem things, like tomatoes, we'll often use other predators for that. But for most of our crops, persimilis works really well. Um, other interesting thing about persimilis, most of the times we tell you that biocontrol, you have to be there first and get them established before the pest shows up. With persimilis, they only eat one thing, so there's no point in even releasing them until you see spider mites. And we've actually been able to cure, I would say, moderate infestations of spider mites without any sprays at all, just using persimilis to get in there and clean them up. They like warmer temperatures, so we'll talk about predators that we use when the temperatures are cooler in the greenhouse. And this is what I really like this picture. Probably the first thing I noticed, the first thing you notice is that the persimilis, the orange one, is actually smaller than the spider mite it's killing. So that's why I say they're, they're aggressive. They're, uh, they come to work. Notice how long the legs are on it because they, they're chasing them down. They're running. The spider mite legs are really short. The persimilis chase them down. They're sprinters, world-class sprinters. They're going to chase down the spider mites and eat them. Um, a good friend of ours, in fact, he used to work in GGS Pro, he's now the, the uh, IPM director for the U.S. Botanic Gardens in Washington, D.C., sent us this picture. And in one of their production houses, they did an experiment where they used miticides on one part of their prayer plant uh, collection, and they just used persimilis on the other. And you can see that the miticide they were using, apparently, were quite resistant to. The persimilis kept them free of, of spider mite damage. So here's a real-world application from a guy who makes his career in integrated pest management, and, he felt enough uh, to control to send us that picture. There's another mite that we like a lot. You know, we have a lot of perennial growers here or people that uh, say overwinter knockout roses, so they have cool greenhouses coming into the spring season. And um, if you have crops that are troubled by spider mite, a lot of our perennials are, Amblyceus andersoni is really unique in that it, it works all the way down to 43 degrees, which is rare for a predator. So as we get closer to spring, we can start to put andersoni out. Now, they're not nearly as fast as persimilis, but the spider mites reproduce very slowly in cool temperatures as well. So the fact that it takes a while for that population to build up is not a problem. The other nice thing about andersoni is that it'll, eat, it'll, it'll sustain itself if there's no spider mites present. They can eat thrips, they can feed on pollen from the plants and so forth. They manage to hang out and, and be there, so they're there before the spider mite population begins to ramp up. Uh, the same gentleman, Jim Wilmot, down at the Botanic Gardens, he released andersoni in March and didn't release them again. In his scouting in May, he was still finding andersoni on the job in their collections of plants there, so it, uh, it will sustain itself. Um, for the most part, um, there's two ways you can get andersoni. This will be true of persimilis as well. Um, you can get bulk treatments where they come and vermiculate and you shake them out on the lower leaves of the plants, they go to work. Andersoni is also available, we call a sachet, and I wanted to explain that to you, and we'll see some pictures of it in a minute. A breeding sachet is actually, it's, um, it's a very small packet, 
and it has bran in it. And the bran is there to sustain bran mites. Bran mites are used to feed the predator. So you also have your, your predator mite, whether it's Cucurmaris or Andersoni or Swirsky in there. So what we have is a breeding colony, and there's a hole where they can, the mites can get out. So there might be 200 mites or so that are put into that packet, but as they feed on the bran mites and they reproduce, they'll pump out hundreds and more than 1,000 of mites typically in the lifetime of that sachet, which can last up to six weeks long, depending on which predator you're using. So here's a way where you don't have to be out releasing and spreading the vermiculite with the the mites in them every week. We can hang a sachet on a plant or a hanging basket or a combo planter, and we'll get four to six weeks of very high numbers of the predators to come out. And Andersoni is one of those um, mites that can be done that way. And here's a picture of Andersoni, almost the same size as the spider mite there. Most of your Amblyseas look pretty much the same. They're very small differences you need a, a, a powerful microscope to see. And this is just how they come. If you buy them loose, they come in a, in a vial with vermiculite. There's a procedure which we give you in the bulletin or how you roll the vial over uh, several times over a period of a couple of minutes to get the mites well distributed, and then you go out and you can sprinkle them out. And here's a picture of a sachet. This is actually um, a um, hydroponic pepper crop up in Canada, and they're using these for um, uh, spider mite control, so they're hanging the sachet right on the plant. We'll talk more about where to place sachets in just a minute. There's a couple other spider mite predators, and it's good to know that there's different predators for different times of year, different situations. There's not one size fits all, and that's why we want to advise you if you're getting into it. Um, Amblyseus californicus, its claim to fame is that it works really well in low humidity. Um, at, at low humidity, a lot of the other predator mites actually evaporate. They dry up and dehydrate so that the adults work, but you don't get reproduction of them. Um, uh, Californicus does quite well in low humidity, so if you're in a midsummer greenhouse and you've got Budley in a hoop house and it's hot and dry in there, the other predators wouldn't work very well. Um, Californicus will. Also, if your mite populations are low, which is what you're hoping for, Californicus can also you know, subsist, uh, subsist and, and sustain itself when the numbers are quite low. These aren't available in the sachets, they're distributed in bulk. And then Amblyseus cucurmus, which a lot of you may have heard about for thrips control. It is a wonderful thrips control product, but when you, especially when you use high numbers like you get with these breeding sachets, um, it'll do a great job controlling uh, spider mites and broad mites as well. And I talked to growers that grow New Guinea and patients baskets about this. You know, a lot of times when you hang those baskets up, it's really hard to scout them, and it's warm and dry up there, so it really favors spider mites and broad mites and thrips. And what I can, I can envision growers doing is when they, they grow them on the bench for the first four or five weeks, and before they hang them up, they hang one of these sachets on there. And the cucumber sachet would not only control spider mites and broad mites, but your thrips very effectively as well. And uh, one-time application, and you don't have to worry about um, getting up there to spray them. So how do you apply them? That's one of the big uh, questions I get from growers. And I mentioned the sachets. The placement of the sachet is, in, is really important. We talked about the fact that it's a breeding colony. So what we don't want to do is hook, take that hook and put it on the south side of the hanging basket and have it hang down there where the sun's beating on it all day long. It'll finally dry that bran out and get really hot in there and your colony won't last nearly as long as it should. So if possible, we like to get it into the plant canopy and where it's shaded and it's kind of humid in there and that sometimes you'll even exceed the six weeks if that happens. If there's not enough vegetation present, you can hang it on the hanging basket clip but hang it on the north side of the basket so the sun doesn't hit it directly during the day and they have no problem climbing up there and going to work on the basket. This is a, a very new product, it's the same sachet, but rather than having a hook on it, it comes out with a little plastic stick and it was originally designed for propagation where one, it needed to be water repellent, the mist won't hurt it, but also we needed a way to, to get it, since we don't have a plant canopy with the cuttings being so small, we want to get it down close to the soil, but we don't want the sachet to be in contact with the soil because it'll wick water up, the bran inside will mold, and then the whole colony comes apart. So the sachets are really, on a stick, are really ideal for that application. But we find growers also using them now in hanging baskets and potted plants because it makes it so simple. Even if the plant's relatively small, they can get it down in the canopy, close to the soil surface, but not in contact with it. So we think sachet is on a stick. That's going to be the next big thing in terms of putting them out. Um, Gemini sachets, which I think you'll see less and less of them over time because they're going to be replaced, but um, they have their larger breeding colonies, and, and it looks like an A-frame. The outside paper is water repellent, so overhead irrigations don't hurt it. The holes where the predators come out are on the inside of the A-frame. We found that water droplets would get in the hole and actually block the mites from coming out. 
And usually you'll see these either on um, where there's crop supports from a, vegeta a vegetable crop, and they'll run down the wires and go down the crops. Or if a grower is growing a bedding plant flat, you can put one of these out like a little teepee in the middle of the flats. It'll cover about 10 square feet um, from one Gemini sachet. This is what it looks like when it comes in bulk. And this is, you know, I've said this before. <laughs> I think growers are the most creative people on the face of the earth. If there's a problem out there, one of you will figure out how to overcome it. And one of the big issues with spreading um, very tiny mites over a large area is, you know, how much time am I going to spend in my day shaking these out of a shaker? Well, growers came up with this. It's a, it's, it's a, a battery power. I laugh because I think it's so cool. It's a battery powered leaf blower. And you can see out in the barrel, they cut a hole in there to put a little petcock in there and there's a little shut off valve. And that, what you see there, mates up to a two liter soda bottle. So you probably know where I'm going next. They take these mites packed in vermiculite, put them in the two liter soda bottle, and they just let this thing idle. It'll spit out the mites with the vermiculite for about 10 or 15 feet out of the front of the barrel. And they walk up and down the aisles of the greenhouse and they put the mites out in no time. And mites, by the way, come with little crash helmets on them, so they land just fine, go to work. Um, <laughs> they really do quite well. Um, we don't even up the rates. They, they survive it, and they are very hungry when they hit the ground, and they go to work. I've even had growers tell me they'll put, tip it up, and they'll hit their hanging baskets with them, too. I think it's a better idea to put the sachets on the hanging baskets, but just show you how versatile that is. So, again, a grower ingenuity at its best. I don't think it's bad, so you can use it. We'll help you make one. Another way that some growers who are breeding pots, they take the same type of, um, the same material of brand that has the, the prey mites in it that you would get in a sachet, and they buy it in bulk, and rather than being in vermiculite, it comes in brand, and they'll put teaspoons to tablespoons, depending on the type, the type of the container, size of the container, right out on the soil surface, and for about two to four weeks, you get a large number of mites out. I see this most often in bedding plants or in propagation before the sachet with a stick came out. And they really work quite well. The only thing you have to watch out for, if you overhead irrigate and you blast that pile apart, you'll, you'll blow the colony apart. You can get it wet, this is like a, a dram for a water breaker, but if there's too much flow, you disrupt the pile, then the breeder pile comes apart. And some growers still use this uh, technique as well. So there's a lot there to cover. And I, what I, I mentioned earlier that we do um, work with, um, we've created an enormous database um, that took a lot of time, but it's been well worth it. And I just want to share a little bit about it. Um, if, if you call us and you have a biocontrol program and you feel like it's some, one aspect of it is getting out of control and you need help um, with a pesticide spray but you don't want to undo all the other predators you have in the house, if you call us and let us know which predators you're using, uh, we'll consult this chart. And you'll see at the top there's a color code there and as you can imagine the red's the most toxic all the way down to green that are considered safe for that biocontrol. And you can see on the chart there some of these are highly toxic. Um, but others are quite safe. Unfortunately, the top of the chart are mostly the more toxic ones. But um, when you see a number inside a block, that's the number of weeks that it remains toxic. So a uh, product like um, some of the natural pyrethrins, it has a red block, so it's highly toxic, but it's only for one week. So I could go in and clean up my hot spot and then reintroduce predators a week later. And a lot of them, as you get further down the chart, are quite safe with it. So this is, in fact, the database is so large, when we print it out, we have to use a blueprint printer. Um, it's so big. We put it on the office door just for fun. We really don't use it that way. But you call any of the, the uh, technicians in GGS Pro and we'll crank this information out for you really quickly and tell you what your options are um, to keep from uh, taking the program apart. We also have that information for um, when it's available for plant growth regulators, fungicides as well, as some of those can have an impact on the uh, biocontrol program as well. And this is really part of what we try to do. We like to support everything that we promote to you. And we feel like it, it wouldn't be fair to get you all revved up about biocontrols and then kind of leave you hanging when it comes to um, compatible pesticides. So we've created that for you. This is probably the most fun for me, this part of it. I, I used to joke for years that the first company that came out with a pre-emergent herbicide labeled for use in greenhouses, I'd buy stock in. Well, OHP did, but unfortunately they're not on the stock market. I don't have any stock in it, but this is a great product, and it has solved a problem that has existed for growers for many, many years. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about it. And also a good time to mention that it is now available in an 18-ounce container. Some of you got sticker shock, understandably so, when you can only buy the larger container. And OHP, as they've done in the past, are very responsive, and they came back with a smaller size container to help our small to medium-sized growers buy something that they can, that they can afford. 
So what do we like about it? Well, it's primarily a pre-emergent herbicide. It does actually kill oxalis and a couple of grassy weeds uh, post-emergent, but we don't really talk about it so much. What we really like is the fact this is a long residual, sprayable, pre-emergent herbicide that can be used in greenhouses, both the hoop house type and the gutter connected greenhouses. And we're getting eight, sometimes 10 months control. I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. I'm not only using it in greenhouses, but out in perennial beds, and uh, we don't spray it over the top of plants. It's not labeled for that use, but we'll spray it in, uh, if you've got a retail area and a gravel bed, you display your plants on, you can spray it once in the spring before you open up. It'll get you through the whole growing season. Um, walkways, roadways, between greenhouses, there's a um, very long lasting product. And I had a couple of people come up to me yesterday tell me how much they liked Morango. Here's a picture from a grower. I didn't ask him for the picture. He just sent them to me. And um, they, it was a grower in New Jersey, and they had two houses side by side. It was a new product, and like a lot of us, we were kind of nervous about putting a herbicide in a greenhouse to start with. So they left one greenhouse untreated. And you can see that anywhere where the ground cover mates up to the center walkway or there's holes that have been worn in the ground cover fabric, the weeds had no trouble finding them. The house right next to it, they treated. Still have holes in the ground cover, but not a weed in the place. He's a pretty happy guy. And um, residual has been, like I mentioned, eight months or longer from the SC, which is a sprayable formulation. Here's a picture taken. Uh, the Morango was applied in March and in July. Picture perfect um, nursery there, not a weed to be seen. Here's a, a mum grower, and this field, this portion of their field, they treated with Morango. When it got to September, most of the mums are gone. See them in the upper part of the picture. But another part of the field that they didn't treat, same story. Anywhere there's a crack, Weeds are tremendous competitors, they'll be there. So we don't apply it over the top of foliage. Um, there's a granular formulation, we'll talk about that in a minute, it's a little bit different in that regard. Um, I work with Dave Barcel from OHP to come up with low dose rates, uh, small that batch rates to make it easy. And what we settled on was one teaspoon per gallon treats 500 square feet. And the practical application of that, it takes just two tablespoons to treat a 30 by 96 greenhouse for eight to 10 months of weed control. You know, you can't hire a high school kid to go out there to pull weeds for two hours for less than that. And I, they won't do as good a job as Morango does. So it's remarkable for less than 14 bucks to treat a 30 by 96 greenhouse for that long. So this is the best deal at the show today. I'll stick my neck out and make a stampede for the OHP booth when we get done here and pick that up. Now, I had a question yesterday from a couple of growers. What do I do if I already have some existing weeds? Well, it can be tank mixed with Roundup or Finale. Now, let's be clear, Roundup is not labeled for use in a greenhouse with plants that are already present. Finale can be. But the mixing order is really important. Um, Morango doesn't play nice with other herbicides. But if we mix the Morango in there first, then you can add either Roundup or Finale to it, no problems whatsoever. This is the picture that Dave Barcel sent me, and, I, and he described it as GAC. This is what happens if you put the Roundup in first. So unless you are doing a science fair project with your kids, so you want to avoid this and uh, get, make sure that your mixing order is correct and everything goes well. A lot of information on this slide. I really want it for your handout. I'm not going to get in detail, but it gives you different rates for different applications than Morango SC, and I thought it was important for you to have that in your handout. Morango G, some of you may prefer to use a granular formulation. Um, do want to point out that the uh, residual is not as long as it is for the, um, uh, for the, the, uh, the sprayable product, about three or four months, but you may, you may have uh, a reason to use it. I want to point this out that um, Morango G, as of today, is only labeled for use in hoop houses. EPA makes a distinction between, they call a greenhouse a gutter-connected structure and a hoop house, any ground-to-ground -ground structure. This may change over time, but right now, we only want to apply it in hoop houses. The Morango SC can be used in either type of greenhouse. Um, one of the things that is noteworthy about the Morango G is there are some over-the-top plant uses for it. You'll need, we need to consult the label for that, and the list continues to expand. The next label edition will have even more crops on there. You can use it over the top of a lot of dormant perennials before they emerge from the soil. And so that might be a good application to use the granular, even though the residual is not as long as the SC. And again, there's some information in here to help you know what rates to use and, and what applications. And I thought that should be part of your handout. Something really neat that uh, we've also come up with to help you, um, a lot of you use Contos and, or other drenchable insecticides. And some of you um, have crawled up almost in tears trying to figure out the drench label for Contos SC. 
I like to tell people it says 1.7 ounces, treats 1,006 inch pots, go fish. <laughs> You're supposed to figure the rest of it out. And it does give a lot of flexibility, and I'm sure that's what was behind making the label that way. But what we did was, because we were tired of doing a lot of longhand calculations for you, that we're happy to do it, um, we created a calculator. Now you can call us or email us with the number of pots and the size of those pots that you need to treat. And while you're on the phone with us, we can quickly do the calculations for you and give you the recipe for it. You can see from here that we can, in this example, I use six inch pots, I could use any size. And I did 10,000 of them. Down below you can see odd size pots like mum pans or nursery containers. We have rates for those as well. We plug those numbers in. We can even change the rate. And those contos can be used anywhere from 1.7 to 3.4 ounces. Um, and so we, we can make that change as well if we need to. And then what you get printed out, this looks kind of simple with only one pot size, but it tells you the amount of water I need and the amount of contos I need to run through the injector at 1 to 100. And then the far right column tells me the number of ounces per pot to apply. We have this calculator that works for Safari, for Marathon, for Flagship, really any drenchable insecticide. Uh, we've worked all this out for you and we use the proper drench volumes according to the label to do those calculations. So utilize that service. It's no charge and we, we want to make sure you use your products right and well. I mentioned earlier also that there's some confusion about drench volumes. It's easy to think that if you know the drench volume, say for bonsai drenches, that you know the drench volumes for, for everything else. And unfortunately, they're all over the lot. And we are bound legally to, to do what the label says. So we put this chart together. And you can, you can stop by the booth and ask us for it, or email us, or call us for it. And it's no charge. And what we've done for many of the most common products, we have put the drench volumes on there based on pot size. And you can see they're all over the lot. And we get a lot of questions on that. Why is it this much for a 10 inch pot? Well, we, we go with what the manufacturer says. We need to by law. And we've done all those calculations for you. And I mentioned earlier also about how much we like foggers. And um, again, understanding how to fog a house, knowing how much water and how much chemical, or if you're using one of the pulse fogs that needs a carrier, how much to put into a greenhouse can be very daunting. For Griffin customers, we're the only company that does this. If you give us the square footage of the different greenhouses, sizes that you have, no matter how many there are, we have some that are over, over 15 different sizes, we put a spreadsheet together to tell you exactly, customized for you, how much water and how much chemical for each one of those products that goes into your house. It has about 40 of the most common pesticides that are fogged out there. If it's not on that list, either it probably doesn't work or it's not labeled for foggers. And we update them every year or two with new products and take old ones off and we automatically send them out. You don't have to request it. Once you're in our database, we'll send it out to you automatically every year or two to keep you up to date. It's just one of the things we do to try to, to serve make sure you get the best use out of your foggers. I have just a couple of minutes. Does anybody have any questions?